Okay, for our readings here, I, I, I'm not sure how quickly we'll get through this. This is, we may actually get done soon today, we may not. This is some of the most important stuff to talk about because it's talking about, in my opinion, two most important things in successful software development, individuals and teams. That determines more than anything else the success or failure of a project. Uh, so, admittedly, if you have you know management above asking for impossible features and impossible timeline, I, I posted I actually posted three articles in the uh, hashtag random. Uh, the first one especially read because it, it is such a classic example of management asking for absolutely impossible deadlines. It happens in the real world. Uh, the daily WTF. Are any of you familiar with that? That's a great place to go for IT horror stories. Uh, it's a, most of what you'll get posted there is, will be posts from actual practitioners saying, here's the absolute idiotic thing we had to do at work, and this is, this is what happened as a result. So those are good, good sources to sort of say, oh, hey, this, this is more common than I thought, and maybe I should change my career. You know, go into double E or something. Uh, no, I should. Software's lots of fun. I've, I've had a great career. I have no, no complaints. Okay. People wear parts three and four. You know, again, this was a lot of reading, but the, the chapters are like three pages long half the time. Big print, big margins. You guys should be able to breeze through this stuff easy. It's not dense reading. You know, it's not like reading about, you know, theoretical verification and validation, proving correctness of programs. This is, this is all anecdotal. Uh, if anything, they tend to be a bit too... Boy, in the course of a chapter, they'll sort of change topic three or four times. You know, they give a title, it's like, ah, oh, let's talk about this, talk about this. Come on, guys, let's try to organize this a little more. That said, it's very readable. This is probably, you're saying, if, if you... <laughs> I'll say this a lot, but I'll say it here. If you remember nothing else from this class, remember this slide. This is how you create great successful software. It seems simple, it's a lot harder. Because you will find all sorts of barriers to doing this. It can be hard to get the right people. It can be hard to make them happy enough so they don't leave. Uh, and it can be hard to get the permission, or at least create sufficient distraction, what my uh, good friend Bruce Henderson calls confusion bombs, something to distract upper management so that you can actually get the developers doing the things they need to do. Uh, and <clears throat> a lot of people in management fancy themselves understanding software development more than they actually do. Uh, and this, this, can, this can create serious problems. Because they don't realize how hard it is. They haven't read armor. You've all read armor. At least you all should have. Uh, they don't realize how hard it actually is. And so they put up barriers. And that's a lot of what people were talks about. Okay. Getting the right people. Uh, now, a lot of DeMarco and Lister, a lot of their research, a lot of their project reviews were in typical corporate settings where you had these issues. Corporation wants people who look alike, sound alike, fit their corporate image. Uh, and IT is not the place to go to do that, okay, you know? I have an animatronic chimp head in my home office, okay, you know? My kids, at Pages, my kids love to come to the Pages because, frankly, almost all the developers had toys of some kind in their offices. You know, there were Nerf guns, there were little, you know, alien scale models and uh, things like that. Uh, we could talk a long time why that is, but <laughs> this is, this doesn't fit into a typical corporate setting. Uh, did it for corporate dress standards. When I was at LPI, uh, Lunar Planetary Institute, about halfway through my time there, uh, they re they there was an old, well, let me back up. LPI was built 
in a old mansion right next door to NASA. The land and the mansion and the other buildings were donated uh, to establish LPI from the estate of an oil millionaire. <clears throat> so it was a great setting. I mean, you literally had these big curving marble staircases up to the second floor and so on. There was an old stone barn in the back that was all hollowed out because this was, this was an old building. And while I was there, they got funds and completely refurbished it. We moved the computer center out there, we moved our archives out there, and my cubicle moved out there. Actually, I went from a shared office to a lone cubicle. And the computer center was upstairs. We had a back slope in 780 had tables with a few terminals, so a lot of my programming, I was programming for, you know, space scientists, really, <clears throat> was up there. Now, <clears throat> I, I like to be barefoot. Uh, I, I, I think it dates back to four years of high school football with my struggles with athlete's foot. But starting in high school, I started wearing Hirachis. These are these genuine Tijuana Barachis. They're made, the sole is cut from a used tire. And then you have a leather upper with, with metal studding. I had a pair of Barachis that, that lasted me for like 15 years before they finally let the wore out. So this time I had my Barachis, and what I'd do is I'd come to work in the morning, and I'd, you know, park, and I'd walk in, go into my office, and I would kick off my Barachis, and I'd work barefoot all day. Because I was back there, I, it was no longer in the main building, and no one saw me. So on this one day, I'm upstairs in the computer room, sitting there barefoot, you know, programming. We had an HP graphics terminal. I was doing some programming to display some data for one of the scientists. And Roger Phillips, who I was actually good friends with, he was the director of the institute, a uh, space scientist out of California. We both misrated as being Californians having to live in Houston. Do any of you from Houston? Careful what you say. Huh? Houston's a great place. There you go. <laughs> it's a big, big city. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, that's that's a phrase down there. Anyway, the uh, <clears throat> so I'm sitting here. Roger comes up with some esteemed guest that he's giving a tour of the institute to, and so I hunch over and I'm mentally thinking, Roger, ignore me. Roger, ignore me. Roger, ignore me. And of course, Roger, being very genial and very nice, walks up and says, oh, and here's our programmer, Bruce Webster. Okay, I can't just sit there. So I stand up to shake the man's hand, and I see Roger look down and see my feet just close his eyes. <laughs> shake his head like, oh, all these programmers are idiots. Anyway, he never called me. We were, like I said, we were good friends. Uh, but it is an issue. So you have companies that tend to want to put programmers in fact, have many of you in your internships, actually, you know, if you go to a tech company, some of them go quite the opposite direction. It's like, oh yeah, we have rotating massages through here. But have any of you worked in situations where you felt more constrained uh, as to your work hours, as to your attire, and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, I I interned at the finance company up in Seattle, and um, so like the. It was an amazing view, 55th floor downtown, you could see everything. But you, we weren't allowed to wear shorts or anything like that. But, but the most relaxed people there um, were the ones who, like, who, like, who, who wore like open shoes. Yeah. And that's like, that was scary. <laughs> um, but because it was Seattle, like, it was a more chill office um, compared to New York. So yeah, I was going to work like on the other days, like, kind of thinking about that and seeing everyone else wearing shorts and yeah. Yep. It'll happen. Yes. Um, just this year we had pants apocalypse where my boss decided to put a only pants rule um, throughout the office. That was very sad. <laughs> Especially during the summer when we wore shorts. Shorts, yeah. And that was right in the middle of summer when he put it on, so Yep. Anyway, uh, now they talk about unprofessional or professional as in a different way than I do. Remember in my article, Tempest, I talked about professional. My idea of professional is you show up and you get your work done. You act like an adult with your other people, you know, except when you shoot each other's nerf guns, but you know, that's that's a two. <laughs> yeah. But but you, you, you show up and you do your work. Here, what they're talking about with professional is when I 
was hired by PricewaterhouseCoopers. I had to go out and buy a new wardrobe because I had to basically wear slacks, nice shoes, and dress shirts. Work everything. Uh, something I was, you know, as a geek, I was not used to. Uh, we'll move on from here. Okay, leadership. I've already quoted a couple times a Dilbert strip I saw earlier this semester where, you know, Dilbert says it's going to take me, point of hair boss asks for an estimate. Dilbert says it will take three days, and point of hair boss says I want it in two days. He says, it will, I can't do it in two days. He says, this is leadership. I'm getting it done soon. Uh, among a lot of managers, leadership is seen as a work extraction mechanism. Uh, it's like, what can we get them to do? How many hours of overtime can we get them to do? What hoops can we make them to jump through? While I was at Pages, while we were still trying to finalize the venture funding, uh, the, the potential investor, basically the lead investor who was trying to put together the, the funding, brought in a, an acting CEO. This was a person who had been a former vice president at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation back east. Uh, generally speaking, a nice guy, but in my opinion, a, a poor manager of West Coast programmer types. Uh, tended to be abusive. Not, not in a loud shouting safe, but just sort of his, part of his management style was if you stood up to him, he would just sit and quietly chew you out and try to put you in your place. Okay, and my attitude is, hey, I don't need this job. Uh, and when we closed on funding, the, the lead investor came to me. I was chief software architect. I was one who had built the engineering team from you know, scratch and everything else. He came to me and said, we are considering this person as the CEO. What's your reaction to that? And my reaction was, if you do that, I will quit the next day. <laughs> I will not work under this man. I said, you know, I can put up with him. He will destroy my team. And they didn't hire him. When I got a different seat, yet Larry Spalla, who I really liked. Uh, not that Larry and I didn't butt heads, but uh, Larry was, was vastly superior as a CEO. Uh, and I, and I, I think... I think this individual was rather stunned that the, the, VC, the VCs basically went back and said, sorry, Webster says it won't work with you, so we're not considering you. Uh, I have a certain satisfaction in that. <laughs> uh, leadership is getting the people to follow you because they trust you. It is a two-way street. Loyalty is a two-way street. One of the things that I did during my time at Pages, one of the two books I wrote, uh, while we were in the middle of, of some of the, the more intense programming stuff, Bruce Henderson, uh, who had served in the Marines and then got into IT, quoted something from Sun Tzu, and I was familiar with Sun Tzu, and he saw it as applicable. I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder how much of Sun Tzu, of the outer border, would be applicable. I wrote and published a book called The Art of Wear, <laughs> which is basically a maxim by maxim reinterpretation of the art of war as applied to developing and marketing technology. And it's amazingly applicable. It really is. And a lot of what Sun Tzu talks about is how you treat your troops, how you get them to follow you, how you make them willing to go through difficult and painful situations. And it's not by mandate. And it's not by a pet. <laughs> the the pant apocalypse. Pant apocalypse, thank you. It's not by this stuff. It's by making them want to follow you. Uh, I've mentioned Carol Teasley here a number of times. She, she technically wasn't my boss. I was the C2 of, of Object Systems Group, but we had about 25 contractors in at Fannie Mae, and she was my direct report. I, was, I would follow her anywhere. 
she was great. She, she, she could chew you out. Boy, you didn't want to be chewed out by Carol. Uh, but she would also go to the mat for you, fiercely protective of her people while demanding the best behavior from them. And that is what is important. Sadly, it's often not what, not what we get. Now, this is something we've talked about two or three times. Most innovation is unwelcome because it requires accommodating change. Machiavelli, the prince, a quote I have used over and over again is probably buried in one of my slides in one of my presentations. There is no endeavor more dangerous or uncertain of success than to undertake a new order of things, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, this isn't an actual quote of an actual translation, than to undertake a new order of things because <clears throat> you have the hatred of all those who profit by the old order and only the lukewarm support of those who stand to benefit from the new order because people do not really believe in the value of something until it is proven to them. That's software development in a nutshell. People hate change, and even the people who are supporting it, more often than not, are like, yeah, you know, that sounds great, but can you actually deliver? <clears throat> So we have this, you know, can't we just do what we're doing, but better, or faster, or cheaper? How many of you have, have experienced this kind of resistance to change? Anyone? Yes? You know, just at the, at the MTC, uh, we had a paper-based system. I said, hey, I can do this in Excel automated, and, my, and I had to argue with my manager for like a month and a half to eventually get him to let me do it, <laughs> just to program it in VBA, so. Other, yes, I remember, I don't remember exactly all the details. But in technical writing, my group proposed a project for like a math lab to to do more automated uh, stuff a couple of years ago, and I think they're doing stuff more like that now. Um, but they were uh, the one of one of our group members was working in the math lab, and she was like, "Oh, there's this one lady that's works like kind of like." the secretary keeping all the documents for the math lab for like 20 years or something. And if we made this, it would make her job uh, superfluous. And, and so like, there's also that, like, you know, we don't want to make people uh, obsolete kind of thing as well. This is one of the reasons why enterprise resource planning, ERP, software <laughs> installations, so often go bad because it involves changing the internal business processes of the company to fit the ERP software. You either change the business processes or you massively modify the ERP software. If you massively modify the ERP software, then what happens when the next version comes out? You have to go back and get that and make the same modifications over and over again. Okay, hiring. Okay, how many of you have already been interviewing for jobs? How many of you in your interviews have been asked questions or asked to do things that made you say, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I interviewed for a, a, a um, what was it, a company that works with APIs and the uh, project had to do with a text editor or nothing mm -hmm. having to do with the company at all. So they, they asked you to do something about the yeah, text editor? Yeah, as in um, basically uh, make or create a text editor, even though it wasn't representative of all of what they do as a company yeah. or any problems that they solve themselves. Who else? Anyone else have some horror stories want to share? I had to do a bunch of like weird evaluation of JavaScript stuff on paper where it was like what's undefined plus null times an empty array, mm -hmm. and, like figure it out on the paper for them during the interview. Yeah. Yeah, they had me take this weird online IQ test thing. They'd like give me five boxes with weird patterns in them and say, which one's different? And I did that for about half an hour and they'd say, oh, you're disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are fads in hiring, and here's the reason why, and why they resort to stuff like this. It's, it's, we're back to the issue of, of uh, 
metrics. Remember the problem with most software metrics? They're, they're not objective, they're not repeatable, uh, they're not predictive, and so on. Hiring software engineers is tough. I've done it. It's one of the toughest things to do. And a lot of organizations do it very badly. Uh, some try to do it well. At Pages, I may have already mentioned this, once we had two or three engineers on board, my process was that, you know, I'd, I'd, of course, I'd read, I'd read resumes and then I'd do, I'd one, maybe I'd one out of ten, do a phone call and just do a phone screening, get a sense of their background, see if they sounded like they actually matched their resume. And we would, you know, when, when someone seemed uh, credible enough over the phone, I'd distribute the resume among the other engineers and say, should we bring this person in? And if I got a unanimous vote, we'd bring the person in. And then, each of us on the engineering team would conduct a one-on-one -on -one interview with this candidate. And we ran, we, I, I had no idea, frankly, what most of the other engineers did. I didn't tell them. I just said, try to assess this. So we would go through, we would you know, each conduct our interviews. And then, when we were done, we would all sit down together and discuss her or him, and then basically take a vote. It had to be unanimous. We literally all had to agree that we wanted to hire this person. I think this is another reason why we had basically zero turnover. Uh, yes? So as far as hiring goes, if you're a manager and given certain budget constraints, you're not able to necessarily give them a, like a super great salary uh -huh. competitively. Um, how do you attract the, the best people in that case? Because a lot of people follow the money, right? So. You, you won't be able to attract them purely based on the salary, and a lot of people will just look at the salary first, and then be like, is this even a job I'm interested in salary-wise? Uh, so what, what recommendations do you have as far as like attracting people? Well, actually, we'll, we'll get into that with some of the other slides, as far as creating a, a, an environment that's attractive to them. In, in the case of Pages, it was, hey, we're doing something really interesting here. This is a startup. You know, we're, we, all, we all sink or swim together here. If we succeed, we'll all succeed together if we don't. And they had to find the project sufficiently interesting. I had some great people who came through and interviewed and passed on it, either for because the money wasn't there or the opportunity wasn't there. Uh, Edward, one of the people I interviewed was, was uh, Edward Jung, J-U-N-G, who I would have hired in an instant. Brilliant individual. I uh, had a, a degree in computer science and a master's in, uh, I think, molecular biology. Uh, he ended up spending years at Microsoft and then went on to Intellectual Ventures, which is a big patent holding company. Uh, brilliant individual, uh, would have loved to have gotten him, couldn't get him. Uh, so, if you're trying to hire, ask people. <coughs> You know, if now the portfolio of work done to date, again, DeMarco and Lister are writing this, and this is sort of dated because, no, you shouldn't walk off with <laughs> source code from your previous employers. So if you have projects you're doing on the side, this is actually a good argument for having, you know, one or two projects you're involved in, whether it's open source, you know, with your own individual project, having stuff you can do. Uh, do presentations and aspect of past works, so again, as long as you're adhering to any confidentiality issues, say, okay, here's what I did here, you know, at, at uh, General Dynamics I worked on three different projects. The first one was adding graphics displays to a simulation of the cruise missile, Tomahawk cruise missile. I also did a project in uh, deriving characteristics to distinguish between tracked and wheeled vehicles with the standoff radar, and I did a third project to do stabilization of large space structures. You don't have any gravity doing natural stabilization. So if you have oscillations in large space structure, you've got to dampen those. <laughs> and this was a project where there were sensors 
that would do counter movement as soon as any sort of vibration. So those are three projects I did in a year's time, I worked on in a year's time at General Dynamics. So that kind of presentation. Uh, the third one sounds a lot like what you were talking about, you know, critiquing samples of flawed or unfinished code, uh, which isn't a bad technique, but you know, part of it, you know, you have the classic, well, you know, write up here an implementation of a linked list in Java. It's like, you know, I have, I have half a dozen books on algorithms. I have probably 20 books on Java. If you actually ask me to do that in the real world, I'm going to go, you know, pull, pull one from shelf A and one from shelf B and say, okay, here it is. Uh, a lot of the sample questions are just like, that's why you're hiring me is because I learn stuff quickly. Because I know what to do. You know, it's kind of like if I had asked the, the people I was interviewing at Pages, if I asked them, you know, write some code in Objective-C. Well, no one was writing in Objective-C back then. Except for Bruce Anderson. He's the only, literally, I think, the only person I hired who had any previous Objective-C experience. But they were all bright, competent programmers uh, with, you know, track records, with good resumes, and they did well. Was there a hand over here? Okay. Teams. Oh. You know, the, 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 the second hardest thing after, after finding, hiring the right people and getting them, convincing them to come work for you is building an effective team. I would not have thought that a big issue until my experience at Pages, uh, where the team almost tore itself apart. Uh, part of it was we we're all doing new stuff. We, you know, I had the work divvied out among the various team members for you know different responsibilities, and these were all very bright and, frankly, as often goes with it, very opinionated developers. Uh, and we had some real personality conflicts going on. As I mentioned, Rick Gessner, one of the engineers I hired, luckily had had training in conflict resolution. Uh, and we literally had a sit-down session. He said, okay, here's how, you, here's how you do and don't talk to each other when you have disagreements. <laughs> and it was, it's fairly, it was fairly straightforward, obvious stuff, but it helped tremendously. And then we did the offsite I've already talked about, about aligning goals, where everyone got to say, here is why I am here at Pages. Here's why I came here. And so everyone understood everyone else's personal goals. And then we said, okay, as a team, what are our goals or priorities that will meet everyone's personal goals? Any good or bad experiences with teams, software development teams? Yes? I know for my previous N340, mm -hmm. I had a good team experience, and part of that was us occasionally sitting down together as a team and just coding in the same room and it wasn't necessarily the same part of the project. What? Yes, I think they saw a few other hands. Everyone's like, yeah, no, I think I did. Oh, come on. Tell them. Um, well, um, Camera's not on you. No one can tell who you are. Yes. Uh, so, working with the animation projects, I've run a few times before, but like the especially between kind of the different branches of that, like there's the art team and there's the kind of more programming and more design focused people and the communication between each of those teams as a whole bigger project team is sometimes very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and not always the most important. Now, one of the things Larry Spellhawk did very well is he actually had sort of company outings. We all went bowling. As, as a company, which was in the middle of the day, middle of the work day, we all went out, went bowling, had ha hot dogs and hamburgers, and then he made, we didn't have door numbers on our offices, so he took everyone's bowling score, and that became your office number. <laughs> Sadly, mine was 53. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty embarrassing. I still have it. I literally still have the little white box that was mounted outside my door. It says Bruce and says 53 on it. Uh, as an engineering team, when Terminator 2 came out, we had an engineering offsite to go see Terminator 2. Uh, 
and all oohed and awed over the graphic special effects, which were just still are. Yeah, they said they hold up extremely well. They hold up remarkably well 30 years later, uh, and we just had great time. So, uh, okay. In this slide, now, now part of this, this is sort of a, a snapback from their other stuff about, you know, this, this, is, this, is, this is the other side, of, this is what I call professionalism. At some point you do have to sort of grow up, <laughs> or at least fake it. Uh, <laughs> immature behavior serves no one, least of all your team members. And part of your willingness has to be to, you know, if you are building as a team, is to say, okay, I'm going to forego this pet belief of mine in order to help the team to succeed. Uh, and it is always good to remember who writes the checks. Okay? So while you may have strong disagreements with management, as long as you're taking their money, you have to work to meet their goals, even if you're in the same process trying to convince them how wrong their particular approach is. This, this gets back to uh, the quote, which I'm pretty sure I gave in here, from a conference. The only way to change things within your organization is to go in every day prepared to be fired. Now, corresponding thing is don't go in prepared to be fired unless you have another job line. This is a discussion I'm having. I have a family member who's very unhappy with where this person works, uh, and, and with good reason. But I keep reminding them, don't quit and don't get yourself fired unless you have another guaranteed job. Because especially in IT, where they, they will use easy things to screen. One of the easiest things is, if you're currently unemployed, we're not interested. Uh, now, the job market has gotten so hot, for perhaps in tech, that that's less of an issue. But there are organizations that will simply say, well, if you're not currently working, there must be something wrong with you, therefore we're not going to hire you. Thoughts, observations, comments? Yes? I think kind of the way I would phrase the whole um, going, going to work very Prepared to be fired. And you said prepare to be fired only if you have another job like I would say don't go into work trying to get fired. No, I no, mean, don't do that. Because that's I that's I have had yeah. I have had one son and one son in law do that in two respective <laughs> jobs and it's a very bad idea. And in both cases their wives were extremely unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told them I quit today. It's like Think about talking to me first. <laughs> you know we have rent and utilities due next month, don't you? Uh, you know that self righteousness vanishes about as fast as your bank account. <laughs> okay. Happy to you know turnover. Turnover is such a big issue. And a lot of management tends to think of programmers as interchangeable components. Uh, if this, this gets back to uh, the, the article that Ruby and I wrote, The Longest Yard. They tend to see you as cogs when it's really more like a sports team. And uh, anyone who watched the Patriots lose badly uh, last night would see how much they miss Gronk uh, and a few others. The uh, it can you know you can lose one or two key players. This this is why I fought so fiercely at Pages for things that I knew would help keep the programmers there because I knew how devastating it would be to lose even one of those developers. Uh, but management doesn't realize this often, and often it, it becomes sort of a well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to bend for this person just because she is critical to the entire project. It's like, oh yeah, actually you should, <laughs> unless you're willing to see the project slip six months. Uh, you may want to to try and figure out how to keep her there. 
Now, this is something that's, that's come up in a number of articles recently, over the past few years. Number one reason why people leave their jobs, their immediate manager. How many of you have worked for a manager who made you at least want to leave your job, if not actually leave it? Yeah. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is a serious, serious issue because often you can waive any amount of money and they'll just say, no, I'm out of here. This, is, this, is, this place sucks to work at. I'm not going to stick around. Yeah. I actually considered leaving my job when my immediate boss retired. Oh, yeah. But I like my job right now. Okay. It gives me money. Well, I mean, I, I can tell you, my daughter Crystal, if I may have come in to, to do her, her usual I'm a CS grad who's been out in the industry for a few years. Here's what real life is like. Lecture. She does a good job with that. I know that a major reason she is still at her current job is because of her manager. She has an absolutely wonderful manager. She loves her. And the manager has been very, very good at making sure that Crystal's salary is competitive, making sure she's working on you know, projects where she can really contribute and so on. So yes, a good manager can keep you at a place that you might otherwise leave. Uh, and if you lose your really good managers, you may start losing your developers. This is, this is something that a lot of organizations don't understand. It's kind of like, well, where's the loyalty? You know, why are you considering this new job? After all I've done, it's like, well, let me, let me count the ways. Uh, Loyalty is a two-way street. If you don't feel that management, either immediate or up the chain, is, has any sense of loyalty towards you or to your fellow teammates, then you may not have much reason to feel loyal to the organization. Any other thoughts or feedbacks on this? Yes? Well, just like that deals really well with uh, his chapter 15 slides and uh, that leadership is service. Yeah. I think one of the other chapters, maybe that chapter also talked about like leadership being more of a catalyst for the rest of the team. Because like really in, in any organization it's the people at the very bottom that are actually like providing the real products and, and services and the management structure is there to enable them to just focus and do their jobs. Yep. Uh, there's a great book by Jerry Weinberg. In fact, one of you had talked to me uh, asking about this issue of moving into from you know more less hands-on technical and more to management. It's Gerald Ger Weinberg becoming a technical leader, and a lot of the issue there is indeed clearing the path so that your developers can truly succeed at what they're doing and fighting the battles for them so they don't have to fight them. Uh, it was something I actually. Did a fair amount of it pages, even as a CTO. I was, was technically wasn't the manager. Jim Hamerly was excellent. He was our VP of engineering. He was excellent. But the two of us, you know, had had our share of battles with the CEO and CFO uh, in defense of the developers and the time and the effort they were putting in and sort of some of their plans to cut things back. Now. It's essential to see spending on employee, employees as an investment, not an expense. How many of you have changed jobs or have considered changing jobs just to work on some newer technology or something that's more interesting? Okay, here's what you'll find out in industry, at least in certain locations. <clears throat> you'll want to go to a conference, you'll want to go through a training, uh, you'll want to bring in some new tools, a new language or whatever. And overtly or covertly, management will have the attitude, well, if he or she just learns this, they're just going to go find a better job elsewhere. Therefore, we're not going to train them. And they have it exactly the opposite. I mean, welcome to a profession. I'm 66, guys. I still am learning new things all the time. I have to. I, I get cases that use technologies that I've never used before. It's like, okay, now I have to come to speed with this. 
They're not always new technologies. Sometimes it's old technologies that I passed over and ignored. But I am constantly learning. The good news is that, again, if you have the right jobs, you are paid to learn new things. You are paid to become a better software engineer and a better technologist. And companies that will invest in training and education for their developers will attract and hold the best developers. There should be budgets to attend conferences. There should be budgets. I mean, books are, is, is a no-brainer. Any good software engineering group should have a big library. And any team member should be able to say, you know, let's get this book, let's get this book, let's get this book. But we have this common management sin focusing on improving near-term performance by sacrificing the longer term. Once again, how many of you have been on a project where you were told to do things in a way that you thought was counterproductive in order to meet a short-term deadline? Okay, a few of you. Well, you'll, you'll face that as well. <coughs> and we have, we've already talked about this a number of times. The knowledge that, lose, that you lose when someone leaves. If they are productive, if they know stuff, if they've got a lot of stuff in their head, you're basically rewinding the whole investigation path out of armor. And layoffs for the sake of layoffs. This, this can be a difficult situation. IT industry, guys, IT industry is very volatile. Simply put. I've been laid off. I've laid myself off. Uh, I was working for a company called LaserGo. Uh, I had just hired a new programmer from the East Coast who had started work. And three weeks after I did that, the company president came to me and said, yeah, we're, we're getting short on funds. You're going to have to lay someone off from your group. Well, the two people were myself and the guy I just hired. <laughs> and I knew that about the company, and I sort of saw the handwriting on the wall. It's like, okay, this is... <laughs> This, this company is on the wrong glide slope at this point. So I laid myself off and I told the developer that I just hired, I said, start looking for another job. <laughs> the poor guy just relocated from Boston to San Diego. Well, of course, that's, that's a nice relocation, but you don't want to relocate, work three weeks, and then get laid off. Uh, so I laid myself off, and actually that's when I ended up uh, being picked to start pages. Have any of you been through layoffs? Reduction forces. What, what was your experience? Uh, it's really weird. <laughs> uh, being in college and getting laid off, you, you don't expect it to happen. No. <laughs> uh, I, I've been working at this company doing frictionless checkout services. Um, the company decided the development wasn't there. Their, their path for investing. Uh, wasn't it wasn't at the same rate as the cost of development. Oh yeah. So they just cut off half of their team. At Pages, and this this is one of the important things I learned at Pages. I was on a senior staff. Our CFO, John Curry, uh, who I very much like and admire, even though I butted heads with him more than once. Our weekly senior staff meeting, he would give us all a printout of a spreadsheet that would show projected over the next like. 18 to 24 months. Here are all the categories where we're spending money. Here's the money we have in the bank from the venture capital. Here's where we run out of money. And the cold equation is where we run out of money, we either are going to have to cut costs or get more money in by then. That's a simple fact of that's a simple fact of business life that frankly a lot of society seems to have forgotten here. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Cold equations, you run out of money and you have to close. Uh, and there's there's no magic wand to say, well, part of the problem is you have, <laughs> you get an IT, and you have venture companies that pour amazing amounts of money into companies that have no foreseeable return on investment or business plan. And it's, it's sort of baffling as to what they see the exit plan to be. This is how we had the big crash in 2000, which is almost literally before all your, you were all like in, you know, K 
kindergarten or something. It was pretty brutal. Uh, we have another tech bubble right now. It's not as bad, uh, but you're going to see some ugly stuff uh, because there are, we just had pretty much the collapse of WeWork which was sort of a classic dot-com thing. It's like, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll make money, we'll make money. The only reason they're still in existence is because SoftBank in Japan said, yeah, we're gonna give you a few billion dollars here. It's like, why? What are you expecting to get out of this? It's a bad idea to start with. But that was so true of most of the dot-com stuff. Okay, growing productive teams. Let's, so uh, go. Uh, this is actually fairly quick. We're gonna push through and get this and then I'll let you go. Best work groups are the ones where the people have the most fun and perform at their upper limits. The challenge is finding the best people and getting to work together. Now, <clears throat> DeMarco and Lister are very clear. They say, we can't tell you exactly how to gel the team. It's sort of magic. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. We can tell you how to destroy a team. But this is what you tend to see with a great team Low turnover, a strong sense of identity as a team. We were Team Bonsai, okay, you know, but for Bonsai, across the eighth dimension, we were Team Bonsai. All our servers were named after characters out of the movie. Uh, and you have this sense of eliteness, this joint ownership, and you enjoy it. This, uh, and also this, teams are not automatically motivated by company goals and may be disdainful of them. How many of you have worked in a situation where you've heard things coming down from upper management, you're like, oh God, those guys are idiots, you know? Yeah. Uh, I won't ask for examples, just for retribution or whatever. Uh, but the most effective teams see themselves as a team, and they work as a team, and they frankly play together as a team. Now, team aside. Here are all the things that companies do to destroy teams. You have this dis distrust in micromanagement. How many, how many of you have experiences of micromanagement in a software project where you've got people in upper management who clearly don't know what's going on, but are trying to tell you how to do your job? Yeah, a few of you are like, yeah, yeah, kind of like. Uh, paperwork, breaking a team up. now. Remote development can work if you have the right conditions, but it is a barrier. It is not an enhancement. Frankly, the ability to see each other on a regular basis, though hopefully not all crammed into a, you know, the same room for 10 hours a day. Uh, some, some companies will break teams up by you know, moving half the team to a different building. That's not a good move. Too many projects or tasks. Shipping a bad product. How many of you have shipped a bad product before? How do you feel about it? Yeah, I'm embarrassed to put it on my resume. Yeah, pretty much. Embarrassed to put it there. Uh, people like to ship quality products. Companies, I, I, I have these conversations with my son-in-law, who's QA for a company uh, here in Utah who's just mortified at how badly the company is neglecting actual quality assurance and is, is much like you, embarrassed to say, yeah, I'm associated with that because it is such a bad product. Phony deadlines. Now this is, you know, based on company desires, not reality. During that long, that oh so long year that Pages was late in shipping, longest year of my professional life, uh, our CEO and CFO were trying to come up with motivation things for us as developers. I have, kept going back and saying, yeah, we're all working 70 hours a week. We all want the same ship. It's not like we're sitting around, you know, playing games on our computer. We're all putting in long hours. And after one proposal they had, which was sort of, I think I mentioned this before, a carrot and stick, you know, if we ship by this date, everyone's going to get a bonus. And if we don't, this is, you know, here are some consequences to be for the team. And I said, this is so stupid. And they didn't do it, which is a good thing. But I ran to my sister, who was one of the senior software engineers. 
and she, of course this had gotten through the grapevine of them considering this. But she looked at me and said, don't they know they're dealing with grown-ups? And that's part of the problem. Sometimes management doesn't realize they're dealing with grown-ups. Partly because we as engineers are sort of playful. As a rule. We all know that. But management sees us again as these interchangeable cogs. And they think that, you know, carrot and stick and we'll do this and it's exactly the wrong thing. Uh, this I've never experienced at all, but apparently DeMarco and Lister had seen situations where companies broke up successful teams because they were afraid they were sort of, the teams were sort of getting above themselves. It's like, well, we'll just break them up and spread them around in other teams. Uh, and this line, most organizations don't set out to kill teams, they just act that way. Phony motivation extended over time, hitting team members against each other. These are all, most, a lot of these I have avoided, but I know of them and have had friends who have gone through this sort of stuff. Any observations or comments here? Any horror stories anyone wants to share? Everyone's like, no, let's get through this and we can leave. Uh, provide frequent, easy opportunities for the team to succeed together. One of the biggest mistakes, I know I've said this and I will keep saying it through the entire course. I have seen this particularly in failed projects that I have had reviews and expert witness, and some that have had reviews of consultants, where the company basically starts a project and it's it's a failure from day one. This is this is a maxim, you know, all the, all the important mistakes are made the first day. It's like this never should have been started because you set conditions. You were trying to attempt too much, too fast, without the proper expertise. Uh, and believing that you could bring extra people on to make it succeed. The opposite is to say, if you're building a team, is to give them short-term projects at which they can succeed. This is actually one of the things with extreme programming. It's like, okay, let's do a you know, minimal viable product, and we're going to do it in the next two months. And then, based on what we learn there, we can revise and refine and decide what we want to do next. Uh, again, very, very tight into DevOps, continuous integration, continuous development. Uh, encourage productive. A lot of this stuff actually shows up also in Accelerate. You allow the teams to self-organize. You allow them to break rules. You get out of their hair and let them do stuff. And this is terrifying to management. <coughs> because management operates typically on classic profit and loss situations uh, and doesn't understand how to make teams truly jealous teams and then build great stuff. Frankly, a lot of great teams are built in spite of the company, not because of it. Uh, now these are the things that their best effort to try and describe how to have a good team. Make a cult of quality. Now that's just about the opposite of what most organizations do. Uh, I've already said before I belong to the uh, X Next employees list. One of those X Next employees. Does everyone know what Next is? Steve Jobs got kicked out of Apple by John Scully back in the 80s. He founded a company called Next that did uh, basically cutting edge, both hardware and software. Uh, I wrote for Addison Wesley a book called The Next Book. I, I, know, I knew Steve Jobs. Not well. Uh, but I knew him, interacted with him. Next, the next operating system, Next Step, is evolved into Mac OS X. Apple bought Next. After, after three failed attempts to develop the next generation operating system, Apple bought Next in 1995 or 6. Uh, and to use that as the next Macintosh operating system, and Steve Jobs within a year had become CEO, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I was going somewhere with that. And now I forget. Oh, cult of quality. Yes, I belong to the X Next employee, but I was never employed list. And a lot of the complaints on there are from people who worked at Next and worked for a long time at Apple under Steve. And basically how appalled they are at the quality problems 
with the latest Mac OS and iOS results, or releases. Uh, stuff that they say basically would never have been tolerated under Steve, which is one of the things Steve did. He was just, uh, he, was, he was deep into the details. And it's part of why the, the people tended to produce great stuff, but also tended to burn a lot of people out. Provide a sense of closure. This is to ship often, ship frequently. Sense of eliteness. Protect them. Let them decide the tactical direction. Encourage diversity among the team. Now, accelerate. Here are, here are two interesting questions. Now, think about this for all of you who have had jobs or have jobs currently. Would you recommend your organization as a place to work for a good friend? Would you recommend your team in that organization as a team or a place for your friend to work? Basically, this NPS, which they call the Net Promoter Score, this is a good way to self-evaluate what you think of your employer. Uh, and these are separate questions. So for example, uh, and I, I, speaking for my daughter Crystal, I suggest the first answer might be no and the second answer might be yes. Uh, she might say, yeah, I have a great team. If you're here, if you're here and in my team, this is a great place to work. And the rest of the company, man, maybe not quite so much so. I'm trusting they'll never watch this. Anyway. Uh, but we're back to the idea that loyalty is a two-way street. If you want to keep and retain the best people, you'd better be working to make sure your best people will answer both of those questions as yes. Uh, those are some quotes. Okay, I think we're all tired here. Uh, by midnight, and I assume you're, again, my, my intent in these lectures is not to replace you doing the reading. I trust that you're actually doing the reading. Uh, by this midnight, by Saturday, this midnight this Saturday, your new status report, watch your next podcast, read parts 5 and 6 of PeopleWare, summary chapter 11, which again, this is a very short reading because right now you should be focused on getting yourself ready for demo 1. First demo is in two weeks, midterm in three weeks. I may do, we still have sync roll, so don't, don't jump up and leave yet. Uh, I may actually throw in the midterm review for the next couple weeks, uh, just so it sort of sinks in what I'm asking, because I know you probably won't absorb everything the first time. I have a couple of questions here. Yes? So I think it says on Learning Suite, people where needs to be submitted next week, so we should be finished. Someone send me a DM on Slack, and I'll send all, all those readings. You don't have to have done until the midterm. Uh, let me call a roll here.